do we have any, um, let me see what we have here. Uh, do, 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 do we have any uh, customer mail? Yes. We do have customer mail or questions? Customer mail. And, and we're not male chauvinists. Now it can be customer or female. We like female customer questions. Um, I have some older customer questions. If you want to go with it. Got a whole bunch of them here. In my clipper board. Okay, here's one. Hey, we got one. Yes, sir. I have an original conversion kit. Can I order just the snorkel? Yes, you can. Um, well, that was easy. Best thing to do is, if you're going to order a snorkel for it, is send us a picture of what you have right now, and we'll make sure that you have everything you need. Uh, that way, we know to go directly on. And I'd love to hear from somebody like that that made the change and what what they found, a lot of times you get better power out of the uh, snorkel than you will, say, an adapter, because you don't have a second Venturian Airstream. I keep forgetting the mic's over here. It's not over there. I keep yelling at the camera. So, uh, anyway, that's cool. Who is that from? I'd like to mention Richard here. via chat. Hey, Richard via chat. What kind of nationality is that, via chat? Oh, you mean it came through the chat line. Okay. Thank you, Richard, for your question. We appreciate it. Uh, okay, we have a second question. Second question. Fire away. Does motor snorkel come with a warranty? Yes. Motor snorkels have a limited lifetime warranty. And so uh, we back them up for the life of the snorkel. We just replaced one from 2014 uh, the other day. And those I like to get back because, you know, a lot of R&D goes into these things and uh, you make improvements over the years. But um, absolutely, uh, the motor snorkel has a limited lifetime warranty. All we ask is that there's just, I can't remember the, the number, but after a certain time, uh, all you have to do is uh, pay shipping and we'll send you a, a, out a fresh one. Absolutely. Uh, typically, they don't go bad, though. They're kind of, they're, uh, what's the word for it? They're robust. I like that, robust. All right, let's see if we have another one here. All right, here we go. Hey. Come on, dudes, we need some questions. Two horsepower per thousand watts, and that 17.5 is what? What is that, Sean? Is that a 35, 32? Uh, 30. Rounded off to 30, yeah, 30 horse, uh, 300,000 BTU. We use the rule of thumb: 10,000 BTU per horsepower, and so far that's worked. We've never had anybody. That's under full, complete, 100% load for a full hour. A lot of times you can get by with smaller line sizes, but all, all our charts and all the information is always designed, all the, the physics, the, the mathematics that go into it is based on full load, full hour, which if somebody's running that large of a machine, 50 amp machine, full load for hour upon hour, that's a lot of power. But um, there you go, uh, 300,000 BTU. These are easy. We got 
some more. You want to keep on swinging, Dr. Hughes? Hey, where, where else are we going? You're not going to show that log splitter again, right? <laughs> 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 that log splitter can be, which is, I love the log splitter video, but. Here we go. Batter up. This is from Bob. Hey, Bob. Email. Email. Hey, Bob. I am interested in a type A conversion kit and any other hoses and regulators required to connect the generator to a 25 or 30 pound propane bottle. Hey, very easy. Um, you can go with the A kit. Uh, if you want to save a few bucks, uh, look for our slip tube kit. Uh, the slip tube kit fits 90% of all carburetors. And so uh, with the slip tube kit, all you need is what we call an NPSK. And if you want a 12 foot hose with it, it's an NPSK 12. So between the slip tube kit and the NPSK 12, you have everything you need to hook to your cylinder. And anytime we talk about cylinders, I always wanna let people know you have to use a used cylinder one that's been filled multiple times. So, but yes. Uh, and it, can you get back to us what engine? And we can tell them what kit really, but should, but if it's, if it's a 3,500 or larger, something like that, as long as it's not a suitcase, it'll be our K9568 kit. And uh, currently they're what, 98 for that kit. And uh, the NPSK 12 is, not in my brain because I don't sell them. I don't know what those things are. 46. 40. No, 49. 49. 49. And if you act today, we'll throw in a free, and I mean free, picture of me. <laughs> no, you don't want that. Uh, you were trying to grow sales. I know, I know. Uh, I don't even want a picture of me. Uh, I hope. Got another question. Yeah, bird ever do. Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Via email. I've been Via. warned by the internet. Hey. That a 20 pound bottle of propane will not run this generator because the bottle will freeze up. Can you offer any guidance about that and how to avoid it if true? Ah, I love that question. How big is the engine? I didn't hear. He didn't specify. Um, a 20 pound cylinder will run almost, it'll run any generator up to 13 horsepower without much issue. Um, now what you can do, and we've said it over and over, you can put it near the exhaust. You don't want to get stupid and put it up against the exhaust. See, you probably can't see it from there, but this is what happens if you get something too close to the exhaust. This used to be a, uh, a radio with cassette player. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you don't want to do that. But if, if you can keep your hand there and it doesn't burn, then you can put a propane cylinder there. And as long as you keep cylinder warm, uh, you can get by with almost any uh, size engine on that cylinder. So that's not true. Just remember too, a 20 pound cylinder no longer has uh, 20 pounds of gas in it if you get the exchange. So um, the fuller they are, the more load they'll carry. You have to remember that too. The fuller the cylinder, the more BTU load they will carry because the gas inside boils and then the ambient heat uh, warms the fuel back up. And I don't know if you've seen our episode, but you should, you should review our archives and look for where we showed you what propane looked like inside. And uh, we actually had liquid propane in here and we opened it up and showed how it turned to just uh, water and no pressure, zero pressure, but we can build it back up. It's a good episode to understand what pro how propane acts uh, under load, but so that's that's not necessarily true. If you try to run a V uh, V twin, that one we were talking about earlier, that Generac fifteen seventeen five kW, it'd probably run for about a minute and a half and then start freezing up. But uh, the whole point is if you can replace if you can provide heat to the fuel, it will continue to provide uh, vapor. So there you go. All right, we have another Kevin. Another Kevin. Also via email. Boy, they're all related. 
Kevin via email. He says, I presume the refueling gasoline while the generator is running is quite dangerous, but what about plugging or unplugging a propane tank? For example, if I was running on propane and knew that I was nearing the end of the bottle, could I switch to gasoline, replace the propane bottle, and switch back to propane without shutting down the generator? All right. For your concern, uh, if you don't mind me suggestion, we have, and campers have them, a changeover regulator. You can hook two cylinders together, uh, and when you hook the two cylinders together, it'll run the one down and then flag you that that cylinder is empty, and they are designed to remove the cylinder while running and put another cylinder back on it, turn it back on, flip the switch, and now when that one runs empty, you'll flag you and back and forth. So you could run virtually nonstop for weeks on end uh, using that method. So, uh, but to answer your question about gas, if you just wanted to really do gasoline back to propane back to gasoline, yes, you can do that, absolutely. Uh, it's a little trick that you'll, you'll learn about it stumbling when it starts to stumble. The, the difficult part of that is when you go from gasoline back to propane, because gasoline has residuals that take a little while, even though the carburetor would run, let's say, dry or empty, and the generator would shut down, there's residuals in there. So when you switch off the propane, uh, gasoline, it runs steady, and it starts to da 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 da, da. You can start opening up the load block or calibrator on the regulator on the propane, it would start to smooth it back out, smooth it back out, and before long, uh, you're on pure propane, then you can turn off, uh, then you don't have to worry about uh, the gasoline anymore. But if, you if it's something you're gonna do quite often, I'd really recommend using a T-check. Now, the other thing you can do, I just said T-check, that was a, I just said changeover regulator. If you want a less expensive way to go, there's also a T-check, which actually is a T that you can tie two cylinders together. There's no switch, there's no window, but the ball inside switches back and forth depending on which tank has the most pressure. Well, what you can do is leave off the full tank and turn on the one you wanna use. Then when you know it's getting low, you can turn on the full tank, turn off the one you know is getting low and disconnect it. That too is designed to remove a cylinder while it's running. And need to get those little, uh, we, we moved to a new studio. We're, we're working on getting it built up, but we usually have our paraphernalia here to show you what a T-check looks like, changeover regulator, that kind of thing. But that's a very simple device. Just goes between two uh, pigtails on a cylinder. If you want to get one. Why don't you get that changeover regulator? I think it's a 1040. You know where it's at. Oh, hope that answers the question. Okay, we got uh, a lot of questions. Cool. All right, this is from Aaron Rawlings. Aaron, yes. Aaron says he would like to have a motor snorkel for his lawnmower, but your website is only for generators. Last week you said your mower has been converted. Yes. By ZTR. So maybe just talk to Aaron about how he can find uh, the motor snorkel that he needs. Well, Aaron, the first step is uh, the motor. You know, like to know the motor on it. Uh, and the other consideration is where you're going to mount the cylinders. Now, mine. Man, I need to get a picture of that. Mine are right behind me. Uh, if you if you if you Google a uh, a John Deere 425 ZTR, you'll see around the back of the engine, where the engine is, there's a, like a shroud built flat. And we have these plates. I wish I had my radio. Um, Sean can bring that plate in here. Uh, I'll, have, I'll have Sean bring the plate in here to show you where you can mount this plate. And um, it allows you to have two cylinders. Psst, quick, quick, quick. I need you to get that plate, the white plate for the dual cylinders. Okay. <laughs> You know where that's at? It's back in that back bottom room, I believe. The white plate. Uh, so let me let me defer your question until uh, you'll hold tight. 
let me, we'll come back to uh, the changeover. What was that Kevin, changeover guy? Uh, Aaron. Aaron, all right. And he just also responded that he has a Briggs Intec V twin 24 horsepower. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this would work for that. Let me, let me get out of from behind there. Yeah. This changeover regulator, is that okay? In my view? Up and to your right. Right here? I need a monitor. The thing's over here. Oh, see, you're backwards, see, right? Yeah. Is that good? No. <laughs> Anywhere near right? How if I get back here? Is it? Lags. Back here? Can you see it at least? No. Where do you see? The wheel. <laughs> oh, it's over here. Is it really over there? Yeah. It can't be over there. Up just a little bit. I think it's pointing over there. All right. This is a changeover regulator. So you see the flag. What you do is you move this to the side that you're pulling from. So this, you look at it and you go, okay, I'm pulling from this cylinder over here. Now, the flag's red, so this says both of them are empty. But when this flag is red, this regulator is now pulling off this side, even though it's pointing this way. So you know, oh, this side is empty, it's red. When you flip it over here, the colors change. Now you can disconnect this cylinder using these pigtails, and they're universal. They go to either one. So they hook right in there, and they go into the cylinders. And uh, you can disconnect it, leaving the pigtail on there. And then when you bring it back full, you know, it's still on this side, and then that way you switch back and forth. So the other device was the T-check. That's You can do the same thing with this, but you get no flag. It'll switch from side to side. So I need a monitor so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, from Aaron is, is there any worry with liquid splashing into the tank regulator? No. <laughs> Plain and simple. Hey, did you bring the rest of the pieces with it? Yeah, the the wing nut? Okay. Okay. All right. Oops. All right, getting back to who was the one with the mower? This is a this is a very nice little device here. You uh, you mount that plate. I spray painted mine. Uh, can you see it? I spray painted mine uh, John Deere green. It looked beautiful. We don't have a cylinder up here, do we? Uh, in the new. Trying to stock your new, uh, don't worry about it. You would, you could put a 20 pounder here, 20 pounder there, and then just wing nut it on. And uh, like I said, I have that mounted on the back side of my John Deere, and it uh, works beautiful. So, uh, to answer your question, yes, we just need the engine model number, and uh, from there, uh, we'll get you everything you need, and if you want the mounting bracket, we can help you with that, but if not, people have all kinds of ways of mounting cylinders, but you want to mount it straight up. Uh, now, and that's on, if it's a V-twin, you're really better off with two cylinders like this so that they work together, and in that case, you'd want the T-check and not the changeover, so you'd want to, because what this will do if it's really, uh, if you're doing a lot of heavy mowing, it's going to be switching back and forth between the two cylinders. So if this cylinder starts to drop pressure, it's going to switch over to that one, let this one catch up, and back and forth. But uh, in summer, it's not an issue. So, oh, you would not believe, uh, you know, how you mower, go, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. man, you put that thing on propane and just, mm. It's like last night I was using my Yamaha pressure washer, man. It was like so sweet. We had a we had a video on that. That was uh, that thing surprised me, even surprised me, huh? You're talking about the weed eater? No, the weed eater. Yamaha pressure washer. Uh, and so it uh, it does amaze me sometimes when you switch these things over how they can really improve performance. So. I hope that answers you all. Please follow up if I didn't answer your question completely. Because I'm addle-brained. 
You had the pressure washer video? Yeah. Anybody want to see the pressure washer video? Yeah. Oh, look, the studio audience said yes. Yeah. So let's go to the pressure washer video. Welcome to the Dr. Hugh outdoor segment today. And today we're doing a Yamaha pressure washer. It is a Yamaha PW3028 is the model number, if you'll notice on the side. But we can determine that also by the fact that most likely it's a 30, as in 3,000 PSI, and 2.8 gallons per minute. So 30, 28. So it's been on gasoline for 33.4 hours. We're going to put a snorkel on it so that we can have it start and run better than it has been. We'll go ahead and run it now, and hopefully we can tell the difference when we run our propane to see uh, the quality change in the, in the uh, adding of the snorkel. So we're going to fire this thing up. All right, we're ready to start. So we've got to have our trigger squeezed, have our choke on for starting, switch on, switch is on, and then let's hope it starts. We came inside after running the unit outside on gasoline and ran it empty. So my assistant Sean and I are going to show you how, oh, say hi Sean, hi Sean. Hi. <laughs> uh, how easy it is to add the snorkel to this pressure washer. As a matter of fact, we're going to go for a world record, show you how quick an installation is. So here's the motor snorkel we're going to put on this Yamaha pressure washer, you can see it's custom designed for it, and we'll be giving that to Sean to, uh, to do. And here's the, the tools required for installation, and that is all to get the snorkel onto the carburetor. On your mark, get set, go! Well, that's it. Sean's got the snorkel on three minutes. All we got left now is mount the engine regulator and get the hose on it to hook to the cylinder. That'll take a few more minutes. All right, we're outside obviously and uh, everything's mounted and you see we even uh, we have a proprietary bracket mounting system that there's no holes drilled in the frame so it makes a real sturdy mount for the, for the gas line and uh, we just happen to put a three and a half on here of course you can go six twelve feet but also we have instructions on how you can relocate this plate and mount the cylinder on the pressure washer so you don't have to move it around if that's uh, an issue. Some people like to have a 100 pound cylinder which holds 24 gallons and then go and go and go. They figure they're going to move the machine anyway. You just move the uh, the tank. And of course we have extension hoses that can go in 12 foot sections. You could go for 48 feet if you wanted. So uh, so now it's we've not started it yet. That's a truism. We're going to get ready to prime it and you're going to see it fire at the same time we do. So uh, Sean just turned the tank on. Set the load block about where we think it goes. We'll give it a little prime. And then Sean's going to pull the trigger. OK, 
They got the 3450. Kept leaning it out, got the 3440. Backed it up just a bit, the 50 locked it in, and it was tacking at 3480. So you see how far out it was. It didn't need to be that way. We want it lean and clean. This thing used to, I wish we'd have recorded that on gasoline. It would run, and uh, put, it would just keep sputtering at idle. It, it kind of surprised you. You'd be standing next to it all the time. Uh, it'd, it'd jump up on you, you know? That's impressive. I've, this is my personal machine. I've had this for two years. And it always, like, kicks for a second. But this is sweet. And that's what propane's all about. It's just as smooth. And it's got great acceleration. I mean, that's like instant response. It wasn't doing that before. So there you go. There's the Yamaha PW 3028 running on the motor snorkel system on propane, purring like a kitten. And like I said, I'm really proud of that because after a couple of years of dealing with that thing ticking up every few minutes, uh, that's really sweet. Sure you, oh, I bet you use your controls and you have a set. You're panning to one side is what you're doing. That's why it's doing that. Yeah. Hmm? I'm, I'm trying to help my producer understand that his camera is wacky mole. <laughs> it's pointing over there. It's like, who's over there? All right. If you can see me. I wanted to show you the two barrel motor snorkel. Should have just left it where it was. That's what his words were. Should have just left it where it was. Now it's crooked. These new studio, anytime you move to a new studio, it's always gonna goof you up. You gotta just stay where you are. Now, can you see, this is the two barrel motor snorkel this is what would go on a lot of the uh, the larger mowers like my ZTR uh, it has the two barrel uh, Nikki carburetor and it just sits right in front in front of the choke plates and uh, put the air filter back on and you is good to go and uh, two hoses to one engine regulator uh, purrs like a kitten all right I keep saying that a kitten uh, what else were we going to show them? Uh, any, oh, you had another question or two? I thought you said... Yeah, let's see. Something about... Uh, what was that one? Uh, have you ever converted snow blowers? Oh, yeah, snow blowers, yes. How does it operate with the colder weather? Yes, again with the snow blower... If you can mount the cylinder somewhere near the exhaust, that's really, really helpful. Um, some people have been real creative and done other things. However, uh, typically, uh, if you get it, if you get it somewhere near the exhaust, you will not have an issue. Now, if you're a serious snowblower that uses it, you know, like you're going around doing houses all day long there is a bolt-on vaporizer that can vaporize the fuel uh, but that's a lot more expensive but typically uh, you know mounting mounting it over the engine for one thing is going to uh, pick up ambient heat from the engine uh, another trick we used to do is run uh, high conductive material uh, like aluminum or brass and run strips off the motor find find you know studs sticking out along the motor drill a hole in a flat piece of aluminum or something bolt it on and run it up and uh, you know like get a large uh, hose clamp and clamp them up to the cylinder so what will happen is hot runs the cold so you know that'll come up and and uh, warm up the fuel so uh, just got to but yeah I mean it it is a true, it's true that, you know, cold weather is more difficult on propane, but um, 
at times, especially if you're snow blowing at five degrees out. Uh, but then again, what you do is you take the cylinder off, go inside, get some hot cocoa and come back out and finish. <laughs> uh, and by then it's probably snowed some more and you're gonna have to do it again. But, but those are the tricks. Try to get it near the heat uh, and even run some heat sinks that will draw heat from, from the motor itself. So hope that helps. A lot of times they have an air shroud that's blowing air over the motor and out, and you can even duct off of that uh, instead of having it just blow out. So any customer mail or anything or any more questions? Thank you. We did have a couple answers to the riddle that I overlooked. Uh-oh. Answers to Yes. So let's see. Come here. Oh, man. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give it to you because I had stop sign at the bottom. Because really, it's not a tool, but I agree with you, man. I lived in a place down in Florida where they had thousands of these out in acres and acres of property. And uh, it was like, this is insane. There's nobody around. But guess what? It said stop. You're supposed to stop. And it says that in the darker light. So I'll give you that one. Good man. Got that one. And hey, we need a bell or something like ding, 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 ding. Uh, we have a winner because, yes, you're right. A ruler is another tool. So what's the prize? A free U.S. carburation engine tachometer hour meter of $40 value. And we'll just get your ad, give us your address and we'll send it to you free of charge. But I do have a few more here, so uh, next time we'll, we'll have to reconfigure our program, whether you have to do two more or not, I think. But thank you. Was that Eric? Aaron. Aaron. Good job, Aaron. I'm proud of you. Using your brain. Brains are cool. Uh, another question slid in. This uh -oh. is a follow-up from Aaron. How much heat can the KN regulator take? How much heat can the KN regulator take? Now that makes me wonder what do you have in mind doing with it? However, uh, it is, man, we've had them in all kinds of equipment without issues. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mount it on the exhaust or anything, but ambient heat has, no, we've, we don't have an issue with ambient heat on a KN regulator. So there is no specific data saying how much heat, uh, common sense. If you have to put it in an area that's really, you know, is going to be radiantly hot. And I'm sure you understand what I mean by radiantly hot. You can have the exhaust blowing that way, but the muffler itself is hot. So if you have that, any type of metal between them with any type of air gap, definitely going, going to be fine. So. Uh, I can't give you a number, but uh, I've seen them on all types of equipment without issue. So, um, unless it's an extreme situation, if you have a, if you have an installation that you really want specific on it, send us a picture where you're going to put it or how you want it. And uh, for instance, you would not want to use a a, a, a U clamp off your muffler and use it to mount the bottom of the regulator. That would not be good because that's going to be a heat sink, uh, like we talked about for the snowblower. So uh, you'd have to have some type of insulator. But uh, yeah, they are, they are robust. I mean, they handle a lot of abuse uh, and keep on getting it. Seems like I dodged that bullet, but I'm telling you, it's just, there is just no data on it. I mean, we could do a test and say, all right, you know, we'll run an engine and put a blowtorch on it and see at what temperature it fails, I mean, but I, I don't think that's necessary. Because a lot of times these questions, they have like a, actually have a real meaning. Like I want to mount it, you know, next to a furnace or something, some type of oven or something. But, uh, but no, most engine ambient heat, it, all engine ambient heat, it can handle within reason. If that makes sense. Questions have slowed down. Seems like we've gotten uh, all the 
questions we're going to get for the day. So I would say, Doctor, you mentioned uh, mentioned looking for dealers. Oh yeah. Particularly southeast dealers. Yeah, if you want to be a dealer, get with us. We have uh, some information we can provide for you. Um, we love right. dealers. You Pardon? Snorkel.com or support at uscars.com. Mm -hmm. You can't see you can't see Brian, but motorsnorkel.com or what was it? How'd you do that? How'd you do it? Support at uscarb.com, right? Dealers at uscarb.com. Dealers at uscarb.com. And what was the last one? Uh, that's it. He's too flamboyant. I can't do that. So any of those things. Or call 1-800-553-5608, and operators are standing by. You can also hit our chat on our website. Uh, the girls can help you out with... Uh, if you can't get a hold of us, you're not trying. I hope you heard that. If you can't get a hold of us, you're not trying. I don't know about that one. <laughs> or we're asleep, but not here. One or the other. All right. But, yeah, if we, have, we have what's called Zendesk. All this stuff is tracked, monitored. We'll get back to you one way or the other. But we'd love to talk to you about being a dealer. Our, uh, it's funny how these guys will taste the product, so to speak, and then you know, start firing orders in because once you understand it and see it and do it, and you show a customer it's a, it's a no-brainer. They want it. It's like, got to have it. Uh, all right. Well, I guess that ends it for this week. We're glad you could join us. Next week, uh, we'll be back Tuesdays at 2 with Dr. Hugh, though I may have a stand-in, sit-in, or something of that sort. Uh, we're also trying to get a uh, one of our dealers from out west to uh, appear on our show. He's very busy right now, but... He's a great he's a great dealer and we'd love to have him on the show tell you about some of his experiences. But Doctor Yu, I hate to preempt you after that wonderful closing, but we did get a last minute question. <laughs> that was good. Hey, preempt me all you want, because I'm just rambling on. All right. I have a this is from Jack over on YouTube. I have a Briggs and Stratton Q sixty five hundred that will not start on natural gas. Any suggestions? So it will not start on natural gas. But runs on natural gas. Um, doesn't specify. All right. I would um, see natural gas takes a lot of it takes a lot more spark in order to to ignite. Now, you know my my thing always is start simple, and these gnats are driving me nuts. Uh, start simple. So with natural gas, you need a good amount of crank spark. So. First of all, make sure you have a good battery. Second of all, make sure you're, you have a good plug. A lot of people ignore the spark plug. Don't ignore it. It may look perfect. You may think you just put one in last week when in reality it was two years ago. New spark plug, gap to 20 thousandths. Make sure you have a good battery. And depending on where you're located too, it's because of ambient temperature. But uh, 5W30 will help it spin faster, give you better spark initially. So all those, you need those several factors when it comes to natural gas to really get it uh, to fire sometimes. So uh, look into those first before you, you consider anything else. The other, other, depending on the machine, how old it is, the last thing you, you check, and really it's a good thing to check anyway, is valve lash. Make sure your valves are set correctly because that makes a major difference on natural. You got to remember the, the chain. Diesel, you know, if you have a diesel engine, it can run on just about anything. It doesn't care. You can put popcorn oil in. I mean, the thing will run. I, I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. It just, pfft. then gasoline, very forgiving. You can have vacuum leaks, you can have nasty spark plugs. It'll usually keep on getting it. It doesn't like the sugar. Sugar is what usually kills them the most. Propane, almost perfectly. If it runs out of gasoline, it'll run on propane almost every time and often even better. But then when you get to natural gas, it's more demanding. It needs things to be, uh, there's more parameters that have to be um, 
Boy, I, I ran out of words. Oh, it's been 45 minutes. No wonder I ran out of words. I only have so many. You're but for 20 <laughs> I know. Natural gas, you know, the checklist for natural gas is a little tighter uh, for good performance. But uh, so check those things. So. Okay, so he cut me off to tell you that we have a support desk on motorsnorkel.com to help you with your natural gas troubleshooting. And the, but, link is in the comments. and the link is in the comments. So as I was saying, you start off with the simple things. Spark plug new, gap to 20 thousandths, oil 5W30, Cold weather, 0W30, people tell you don't do it, do it. Um, battery, good cranking battery. And finally, valve lash, check the valve clearance if all else fails. Uh, as long as everything else is proper. Uh, and of course, if you're priming it, we had a customer the other day, when Sean asked him about priming, he said, oh yeah, I hold it in for how long? 30 to 45 seconds. That'd be like taking a garden hose, putting it in your mouth and going <laughs> for 30 to 45 seconds and say, all right, are you ready to drink? So uh, it usually just takes us. As a matter of fact, we had a, a regulator a customer uh, put high pressure gas pressure to it, you know, because our engine regulators are not supposed to have over 11 to 14 inch water column. He put high pressure to it sent it to us to test. We put it on the machine and it was acting all kinds of freaky and knew right away the diaphragm had been stretched. So we put a new diaphragm in it for him. And I love what Sean said after, because you could hear it in the shop, just da 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 foam, fire up and start running, put it on the load, beautiful. And he walks by and says, I didn't even have to prime it. So there you go. So be, uh, be gentle on prime. Speaking of prime, prime time is over. i am got to go. So uh, we appreciate it. Uh, glad you could be here with us. Tell your friends, like us, pet us, whatever you do with Twitter and Twitter and all that stuff. I don't know about those things, but uh, enjoyed having you. And uh, so that's it, Brian. That's all we got. All right. So next week. We invite you back to Dr. Hugh, Tuesday at 2. Good day.